Um, I wanted to start off by uh, welcoming everybody to uh, OPO Startup Week 2020. So this is part of St. Louis Startup Week. So as you know, every year about this time, uh, the region, uh, a lot of times we'll do a lot of events around this week uh, for entrepreneurs and startups in St. Louis region. This year, because of COVID, it's all virtual. And, and so we had asked us to participate in this. And I said, well, sure. Well, what are we going to do? Well, I always enjoy an opportunity to uh, get caught up with all of you. I do get to talk to some of you one-on-one -on -one, um, at various times around the OPO campus, but um, we really haven't had a, a group meeting uh, in a while because of COVID. So, uh, and we, you know, we missed our birthday party in the spring and now we had, you know, we typically do our demo day. And uh, I know a lot of you have actually participated in that in the past. So. Instead, this year we're doing um, a, a video roundtable, and we have other people out that are, are participating and can listen in and ask questions um, as we get started. But we also um, are recording this, and so we'll make it available after the fact as well. Uh, and for those of you that don't know that, that are out there, my name is Randy Schilling, and I'm the founder of OPO Startups. So uh, OPO Startups, you know, we started uh, in 2015. And um, it's been going strong ever since. And so a lot of you have been, uh, these panelists here have been part of that. Um, and we're located in historic downtown St. Charles. Uh, we have about 150 plus entrepreneurs uh, slash uh, small businesses and others that are part of this uh, venture that we got going on in, in St. Charles. So we're excited to be part of the St. Louis uh, entrepreneur um, ecosystem. And why is that important? Well, St. Louis is ranked in the Forbes top 10 list for rising cities for startups. So that's kind of a cool deal. And, uh, and then uh, just want to give another shout out for uh, the folks that are putting together the Startup Week in St. Louis. You know, there's a lot of volunteers and, and uh, entrepreneurs and community organizers and whatnot that make this uh, week happen every year. And we very much appreciate all their efforts. So I thought we'd go ahead and start with, um, I don't know if I, I'm going to share my screen so that you guys, I have your logos, some of your, I have them, I just give props <laughs> to the people that are out there. So everybody kind of knows who were, um, who were, um, who we're talking to today. So I'll let you, we'll introduce each of you out there so that you can kind of, um, let me see if I can get this go. Yeah, so um, so we're very fortunate to have five um, OPO members. They're all founders of their companies, and a lot of several of you have found multiple companies. And and uh, I'll let you all. Some of this is your past, and some of you are scheming out new things. And <laughs> and that's kind of the cool thing about OPO. It's it's kind of becoming a a um, you know I I think I'm on. Some somebody's asking me about membership. Where, well, that's I think it's my fifth startup that I've done. So, and and I'm not alone in that scenario. A lot of you all are doing similar type things. So, um, so anyway, I want to start by uh, Cindy uh, Cummings from uh, yeah. DIY Style mm -hmm. and and also the Vacuum and Sewing Dealers Trader Association. I'll let you do a quick introduction and then yeah. we'll jump down to Jordan and others. So you want to just tell real shortly, yeah. Cindy, yeah, I, tell I, us I... about what you're all doing. Yeah, well, I, I came to OPO, you know, when we were working with and still are with DIY style. And just to give you a, just a slight background, um, I've always worked in the home sewing and fashion industry. Um, we've done videos and licensing agreements and several things um, under the DIY style umbrella. And when I came to OPO, um, we brought a new product to market, um, a new type of cutting system for the home sewing and craft industry. Um, but actually earlier this year, in the middle of all the, the COVID kind of craziness, I'll call it, um, the industry association that I had worked in-house with for about 10 years as the education director, unfortunately had to close their doors. So I kind of stepped up to the plate and worked with a bunch of other people um, to make some things happen. And now um, we've moved that whole trade association here to St. Charles. And we're working throughout, you know, the OPO startups, you know, ecosystem with some new projects and some things that I think are going to be very valuable um, to our membership. We have about a thousand independent retailer members nationwide and actually I should say internationally. So this is quite 
another, you know, step for us to take as an organization. And, um, you know, it's really great to be part of OPO in the middle of all of this. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we're fortunate to have you, Cindy. And Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Jordan, I guess you're at a site, job site. You should tell everybody about Snap Pro and what you're up to. Give a quick introduction. And uh, uh, and um, you're actually working right now. You're in one of your vans doing a job, I guess. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, Yeah. now you're good. Good. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm actually in my personal car right now, but uh, yeah, on a job site. Sorry, I'm not working, but hey, it's pretty cool <laughs> that we can connect like this nowadays, huh? Excellent. Or, yeah, anywhere, cool. so anywhere pretty much. So my business is Snap Pro Audio Video Smart Integration, and we specialize in primarily uh, luxury residential audiovisual uh, smart home automation systems, and then also commercial and hospitality as well. Um, I've been in business with, uh, doing snap pro. It's kind of my, it's actually my first startup, I guess. Um, I started it in 2015 prior to that. Um, I had kind of lived and worked all, all over the world with an audio visual company called swank audio visuals. They were based out of St. Louis and swank had specialized in, uh, hospitality conference, audio visual support services and design and sales, et cetera. So, with my business, I started it in 2015. I moved back to the U.S. from living in Dubai on contract with Swank for about four and a half years. Started my business because I wanted to change gears and get into the IoT market. I'd kind of been tracking that for a while and smart home automation. Um, it's been around uh, since like the 70s, 80s, but now it's just with, with connected devices. It's just booming right now. And um, I've seen significant growth uh, with my business so far. Uh, I started the business with about three thousand dollars cash. Um, Two thousand seventeen started to take it seriously and pursue it full time. I think in the first year I did like sixty thousand. The next year I did three hundred and forty five thousand. Uh, last year I did six hundred and fifty thousand, and this year we're on track to do eight to a million. So I'd say we're scaling pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's and it's very cool. It's exciting. exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah, and being an entrepreneur is definitely not easy. Uh, well, we'll have to get you. You're <laughs> you're on your way to the uh, Inc. 500 list here pretty soon. So there we'll you go. have to make right. sure you we'll pay see. attention to that. We'll see. All yeah. right. Uh, uh, another uh, uh, Craig Duckworth. So you you want to tell everybody about Belta Technologies and what you're doing because you also are starting to starting to grow. Uh, pretty significantly right now too. Yeah, thanks Randy. Um, yeah, Fred Duckworth, I'm one of the founding members of Delta Technology. And we've been around since about 2018. Um, and our primary focus is really on connected devices within the industrial manufacturing where we go in and we provide a digital safety journey from, from point to point in the manufacturing arena and the industrial space. Um, you know, that's one of the one of the businesses that we have. We also have a separate division where we do um, a an encrypted wireless solution within gaming environments, which has really played key in the in the era of COVID where casino operators are trying to socially distance while keeping as many games on the floor as they can, where we can go in and we can provide a wireless solution that's fully encrypted, allowing them to modify the gaming floor as they need to without all of the wires that they have traditionally in the casino environment. Uh, but yeah, yeah. We've, we've been growing substantially in the past year. It's been a little difficult during COVID um, as we see the work environment has changed substantially from remote workers to, you know, people that are not in the office. Uh, but you know, like everyone else here, we're adapting and adjusting and modifying almost daily to, you know, to, to play within the arena of attendance. Candidate. Yeah, that's cool. Well, we're excited to see see you doing well and continue to grow and, and uh, get through the whole COVID thing, which, well, that'll be one of my first questions I ask you is about COVID. So we'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jeff Dittner. Jeff, you were one of the original members of OPO. You were OPO before OPO, you were a member and uh, a serial entrepreneur at that. So you wanna tell everybody what you're doing these uh, days or at least what you've done recently and, and sure. uh, 
share with everybody? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Randy. Happy to be here. Um, so my name is Jeff Dinter. I'm a technology entrepreneur by by background with a focus on design. Um, I've started a few companies at, at OPO. The, the first, as Randy said, uh, was in a back office in the, the annex building uh, across from the main OPO building, I think before renovation even started. So take you back a, a few years. And uh, that company was called Embassy. It was a design studio for startups. So I'd help working with early stage founders on their product design. So if they had a web or a tablet um, or um, a mobile application, I'd work close with most founders who had domain expertise in a certain uh, era, uh, industry. They wanted to solve a certain problem in that industry. I'd help them figure out what that 1.0 product looked like, um, what the roadmap was and really help bridge um, the gap into the technology side. So making sure that all those pixels and those interface uh, decisions were as good as they could be uh, for a new product. So I did that for a few years and worked um, with startups in St. Charles and also a lot of startups that were downtown in St. Louis. And eventually I moved on to the actual product side. So instead of uh, working with other founders, I, I became a founder and started a company called Tenant Loop, which was a mobile first communication platform for property managers. So we made it really easy for property managers to give a better experience to their mobile first renter. So the, the modern renter who lives on their phone like many people do do today, we wanted to make sure they could communicate with them well to um, send them satisfaction surveys and just really enhancing that overall experience, similar to what Airbnb had done for the short term rental space and really just kind of giving that concierge service we wanted to help property managers do, um, do that for their tenants who were living uh, in their single family rentals and apartments. Uh, we thought there was really a, an interesting kind of uh, gap in that, the real estate vertical around the, the consumer's experience. So uh, we went after that and uh, that company was acquired by one of the leading property management software companies in 2017. And my team and I stayed on with that company until earlier this year uh, when I parted ways and. Uh, currently back into founder mode, looking at, at gaps and opportunities in, in real estate tech and the financial verticals. Uh, yeah, yeah, very cool. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. And then, uh, Sean, you want to, I put down Grillinator because I know you can go to that website and buy all kinds of grilling stuff, which I have my, my uh, heavy duty uh, uh, grilling brush that I got from you, as well as I think some stuff to shred uh, my pulled pork, but, uh, but you do a lot of different things. It's not just that. So why don't we uh, have you introduce yourself and tell everybody what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. My wife says, if I, I got to run all new ventures by her because it's gotten to be quite an addiction. So, <laughs> um, but uh, kind of Grillinator is where it started and we had a real fun experience there, uh, you know, using, um, uh, doing the the grill brush on Kickstarter and, and and did really well with that and that business still going more of an autopilot type of business reorder and and just keep selling online but uh, focus has now definitely moved on to a few other things since then Dr Olivia Naturals Dr Olivia Naturals .com, a supplement business uh, nutrition company in partnership with a um, with a doctor here in the St Charles area that formulates and then I kind of handle the sales side of it and retailing side. And then um, kind of my core business actually originally through the years has been uh, energy sales in deregulated markets uh, in the US and actually international. And uh, that's kind of got a couple of sp <laughs> spinoff businesses related to it. I've got a, a subscription app uh, for salespeople in that industry. And, um, and then we have a, an apartment services business that is kind of related to that as well. So it's uh, quite a web of of things that I'm trying to unwind on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna drop this. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. We're gonna go ahead and uh, open it up and um, and uh, see if we can't. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, and I'm gonna ask a couple questions, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion, and then see kind of where this thing goes. So. Uh, uh, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year for a lot of reasons, but but uh, certainly on our businesses in terms of uh, COVID, you know, we've all had to kind of change gears and operate a little bit differently. And I thought uh, maybe we'll go around the, the screen here and, and just real quickly talk about how things have changed for you because of COVID, uh, you know, and, and maybe share with people. Uh, how you're doing things a little bit differently, you know, um, 
you know, if I'll give an example for OPO, for example, you know, uh, well, we, you know, we went out and actually invested a lot more into private offices because people were a lot more conscious about, uh, you know, their own wanting their own private spaces instead of being in a more of a co-working or open area. So, so we built out, I don't know, about 20 new all private offices and, and uh, it's amazing to see how, what the demand is for that right now, which has been really good, but, you know, but we, instead of pulling it, we actually invested and, and have seen growth in our membership because of that, which has been kind of neat because, um, yeah, anyway, so, but what are you, what types of things, what are you, how are you all adjusting and living with COVID right now, which has uh, been a difficult year overall. So Cindy, you want to start? Oh my goodness. Well, I think when, you know, like anyone from 2020 started, everybody's like, oh, it's a new year, clean slate. Let's just keep going. And we started most of our year by, um, you know, being at a national trade show in Las Vegas in February, um, you know, promoting our, our base product, which is our, you know, new cutting system and things like that. Um, yeah. had no idea when we walked out those doors, you know, and, and after, um, um, Valentine's Day, you know, what the world was going to end up looking like, you know, and, and before we knew it, we were thrust into COVID and everything else. So, so our company, you know, went directly from promoting our own product within the, the sewing, you know, independent retailer, direct to consumer space to, you know, hearing about our industry association closing down when it's a, it has a 40 year history as being a trade association. So it's not, it was a big deal. Um, so, and because I had had, you know, the in-house experience with them and, and knew a lot about, you know, the inner workings as well as just all the challenges along the way from everything from being an educator to now a, a, you know, supplier basically in this space, we decided to take that on. So now, you know, um, in the middle of all of this, you know, we're working with retailers, independent retailers across the country, having their challenges, listening to them as an association, trying to, you know, figure out, you know, what that path should be looking like and redeveloping an entire association, you know, to really meet the needs of all the members. So we've had to me probably, and I hope, <laughs> probably the craziest year in my entire career in history of, of anything. Um, and just about the time you think, oh, you know, don't ever think you're going to rest on your laurels for even two seconds, because the minute that happens, you know, you get hit with a whole nother, you know, set of things to learn about. Um, and, and that's part of, I think, just being an entrepreneur. You have to always be open to constantly learning and just being ready to, you know, turn left when you need to. Yeah, yeah. So how about you, Jordan? What, uh, what has COVID uh, meant to you and your business? Has, has it changed? I know, you know, when you're going into these luxury homes, you know, these people are going to be pretty particular about, about that, I, I suspect. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's definitely changed. Um, so for, for homes, you know, when we're servicing homes or businesses, um, we always just ask our customers, you know, would you like us to wear a mask and shoe covers at a basic level? So, you know, we minimize, uh, bringing anything inside and, um, we, we've been following that. We disinfect, uh, devices like remote controls or iPads or iPhones that we use during kind of a setup or a programming process before we return it to the customer. So we've gotten in good practice of that. Um, and overall COVID, you know, with the pandemic, we've seen it, seen an, uh, uh, a uh, increase in business just across the board because most people are working from home doing these kind of calls daily and they need reliable yeah. internet service and so on and so forth. And they're in home now to think of all the ideas of projects they want to do and complete so that helps as well and that's helped us kind of uh excel some more auxiliary installations for audio and video so yeah it's it's been it's been a positive thing for us so far so um, as far as uh the most requested tech people are wanting in their home during COVID, what is it home theater <laughs> a lot, <laughs> lot, lot of entertainment huh yeah i got yeah no and uh, i would say a wireless internet networking they, they 
typically they're wanting to upgrade it right now more, just to make more sure more bandwidth. More bandwidth, yeah. yeah. I got to do all the streaming. How about Craig? How about you? As COVID, uh, what's it meant to you? I know you talked a little bit about, you know, the selling process, especially in the manufacturing space, where a lot of it was shut down at the beginning of this. Now they've a lot of them have reopened, but. But, um, you know, maybe talk a little bit about your scenario. What has COVID done, um, you know, to your business? Yeah, um, a, a couple of things that we're seeing, maybe. We're kind of like Jordan. We're, we're seeing a lot of clients, manufacturing clients, especially asking for secure remote access with an audit trail. There's always been VPNs and ability for, you know, the remote workers to have access to the manufacturing but when the entire workforce was thrust from home, you have engineers that are running the manufacturing facility and that need to be there if something happens to that environment and they have they lose a packaging line or they lose a part of their manufacturing, they're very, very cautious to bring outside help in for fear of injecting a COVID into that manufacturing facility. Um, you know, manufacturing as a whole really has not shut down. It really spiked. You think back into February, March, the run on toilet paper, the run on, on needed items that people ran to stores and hoarded. Now those manufacturers are been playing catch up and they've never closed down. But you, we see the, the horror stories from Tyson, from Smithfield, where in their entire plant is shut down because of COVID and it, you know, really puts a crunch on delivering those goods to yeah. the to the, the society. So we're, it's it's been an uptick in that piece of it for us, but it has made it more difficult to get into the facilities to do the tasks that we need to do because of the hoops and hurdles that we're being asked to jump through because of the manufacturing facilities being more cautious. Yeah. But overall, I think it's been going well. Yeah, I think overall, I mean, I think in general, I think people have, uh, have uh, you know, from, a, from the COVID standpoint, have looked at uh, trying to sell. I mean, a lot of companies have, organizations have really gone into crisis mode where they kind of, all right, we just have to get through this survival mode. And because of that, you know, when you're trying to sell or introduce new solutions, they're not necessarily looking for, well, I mean, in COVID time, they might be looking for new Wi-Fi, you know, something specific about COVID. But by and large, you know, they're just trying to get through this uh, odd period that we're in right now to get uh, to the other side. And if you're trying to sell new stuff into that environment, it's, it can be difficult, you know. It so is. We're seeing a lot of the organizations sitting on what funds they have, not knowing are they going to need that funding down the road either in the next couple months of 2020 or the beginning of 2021, or yeah. if they spend it now, they're, they're holding on to those funds because everything is so unknown. They just really don't know. Yeah, business owners and, and operators usually do not like uncertainty. You know, that's mm -hmm. uh, one thing you try to avoid. Uh, Sean, you want to chat? How about from your perspective? I mean, you're, you're definitely, uh, you're in a lot of different areas, but I know... No, you have a lot of, you know, maybe on the energy side or whatever. I don't know what, uh, well, anyway, do you, want, do you have anything you want to add to that conversation or about COVID? How has it impacted your business and what you see out there? Yeah, you know, thankfully enough for COVID and in, in majority of ways helped business for us. I mean, honestly, the biggest problem was restocking as far as like the retailing sales side. Nutrition sales went through the roof, you know, uh, grilling is largely the same. It was a matter of we ran out and couldn't get more in. So, but on the energy side, what was interesting is there, there, there was a little pivot involved there. Um, you know, a, a significant portion of that business involves a, a team of salespeople that I have down in Texas. Thus the, the Texas hat I've got, <laughs> I go to Dallas quite a bit. Um, and, you know, they canvas kind of B2B. And, you know, when business is shut down and don't let you walk into the door, they just, you know, they're shut down. That changes your entire business model of acquiring new business overnight is uh, a daunting task. And, you know, I see one of the questions that somebody asked here is, you know, how do you know when to fish or cut bait or change bait? And <laughs> it was one of those situations exactly. It was a matter of trying changing bait out pretty quick to, 
to see how we could get in the door and get the phone to ring, you know, with our, our, you know, target market in that situation. And um, I think that's definitely where there's an advantage of being a smaller company, being able to pivot faster. And, you know, thankfully I've got some pretty creative salespeople that, you know, found ways of, of making the phone ring and, and creating a referral program to get our existing market to refer others in their industry. And, um, you know, so it was a lot of creativity, you know, we, we tried some creative direct mail, you know, um, instead of walking in the door, you know, uh, going and dropping off gifts in front of their door and trying to kind of <laughs> a little bit of, a little bit of bait to, you know, literally bait <laughs> to get them to, yeah, to, to yeah. pick up the phone and call. So, you know, we just uh, really subscribe. I, I think Gary V had a quote a while back that, that I'm a pretty big fan of. It's, I'm, I have a horrible memory, but it's one of the few that I remember something to the effect and of, you know, downturns or, or recessions, depressions, or, you know, really just the, the trigger that causes businesses to fail that never should have been in business to begin with. Um, you know, certainly there's, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's an exception to every rule, but I think, you know, that applies to COVID, you know, you see restaurants or some restaurants that have done extremely well and actually boomed because they pivoted fast and, you know, found a way to, to do more business, you know, in yeah. the, uh, you know, pick up or carry out arena than others. Um, so, you know, we just kind of did that and it took a lot of experimenting, you know, fail fast and we found a couple of things that worked and we ran with it. Yeah, I, I would imagine, and I don't know this, but I would bet that you're probably in the vitamin D supplement or something like that. Did you get into that? <laughs> we do sell some D. <laughs> See, <laughs> I knew. I didn't, we didn't even talk about that, but I thought, I thought well, selling that vitamin D. But you know D. what? There's a lesson there. We were a little bit slow to identify that. And by the time we went to order, <laughs> it, it had done been, you know, wholesale supply was was gone for a while. So we were out for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know my wife keeps pushing vitamin D in me every day. Zinc. <laughs> Another Jen? good one. What's that? Oh, zinc. zinc. Yeah. yeah. You don't want too much zinc, though. At least I've been told. I don't know. But... Not too much, but you got to have it. No, yeah. Jeff, how about you? Your last one on this topic, and then we'll move on to something else. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of have two different perspectives on this. One is um, earlier this year before, uh, before COVID, I was um, maybe in the five or 10% of a, of a 300, 350 person company that was remote. So um, I was very, one of very few of, of uh, employees that was not at HQ every day. So I kind of lived in that remote work world already. Uh, since then, obviously, that company has gone 100% remote. So obviously, there's a lot of changes in, um, in how business is done, whether it's uh, in, in person or a technology company, whatever that is. So it's been kind of an interesting evolution just to see from afar, knowing that uh, this has forced companies that either A, uh, could be remote, but had made the decision to not make the the, the investment uh, or potential risk of going remote, uh, it really accelerated that in a lot of ways. And I kind of saw that firsthand and, and how it bridges into my new world is being, be, being between ventures now, I do have some pretty important decisions early on when I'm looking at building a new company. It's um, is it a remote first company? Uh, and that's normally yeah. only a handful of people that are crazy enough to start companies right now, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm one of them. So, um, it's looking at if this is a remote first company versus having that, that headquarters, um, with remote as an edge case, it definitely breaks down the barriers of a, the talent that you have, uh, access to. So, um, that's one and just be business in general. So new partnerships, all those things, remotes being more and more common. So, uh, a lot of these changes I think would have, uh, been coming at one point, but as far as remote first companies, I, I think that is just a, a new thing that I'm uh, looking at um, from a few different lenses, but I, I think it's exciting looking at the benefits that can come from, from that. And I, I think it also ties in, Randy, to your point, um, a movement in general outside of my, my particular situation is the more even larger companies where people are working remote, that doesn't mean necessarily that all of them will want to work from home. I think there's going to be a mixed bag of some people that are fine working at home and will get, you know, the high speed at home and be fine. And I think there'll be the other handful that are fine not going to the big office with more germs or a different city, but they do want an office or a place to call work. Yeah. Um, so I do yeah. think there's going to be uh, an evolution there, um, not just the physical space, but the culture side of it, of how do we maintain a onboarding new employees or building a team, but also just keeping that culture when it's the zoom uh, 
happy hours after work. It's how is that going to evolve? Are there things that I'm thinking about uh, that excite me? Because I don't, no one has the answers yet, but I know a lot of companies, uh, their, yeah. their teams are investing time in figuring that out. So, yeah, it's going to be very, really interesting. Was it today that Pfizer announced that they have a vaccine that's 90% effective? And I think it, you know, they're talking <laughs> relatively soon. I'm not going to get into politics of all that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see, you know, what things are like, you know, six months, 12 months, I don't know, 18 months down the road, it's right. going to be different. And so it'll be interesting to see how companies evolve. Uh, real, real quick, we had uh, somebody uh, on the chats, uh, Doug Elliott had asked, uh, if you are looking at investors, who's investing and their objectives and terms different in uh, the time of COVID? And so the question is, uh, when you go out to the investor community, are there objectives and terms different in times of COVID? And I know a lot of you guys are bootstrappers like me, what, what, you know, but sometimes we do uh, do go out. And Jeff, you've raised a little money, I know, and, and I've done a little bit corporate type stuff. Anybody want to comment on investors right now? Any thoughts on that in the time of COVID? No? I, can, okay. I, can give a, I can give a quick ahead, perspective. So, um, sure. At least from, from the investors I know, I, I, I do think it's going to be uh, dependent on a lot of variables, maybe outside of their traditional investment criteria. I think the way that an angel or a, a VC firm looks at um, opportunities is definitely evolving from my perspective and from my conversations, but a lot of those fundamentals um, are probably going to be the same, uh, but there may be new opportunities, whether it's green or solar energy, whatever those pieces are. And like the other folks on the panel that are talking about uh, industries where business is accelerating, um, particularly businesses yeah. that will not have a wind down after back to work uh, happens. I, I think the, the working from anywhere, et cetera, those types of examples, um, I do think that's going to affect some investment thesis over time. So that's my- Yeah, I think it's very much industry by industry. I mean, obviously, you know, if you're in the uh, Zoom business these days, you know, helping companies work virtually, that those are going to be spots that investors are willing to invest in. And uh, if you're happen to be in the commercial real estate business right now, probably things are a little bit tough right now. So I think it depends on the industry, you know, and in terms of you know, there, there are definitely opportunities out there that this thing is created, no doubt about it. And, um, but then at the same time, you know, there are uh, other industries that are hit pretty hard and are just trying to get through the other side. You know, if you're in the travel business of anything like that, or, um, uh, or if you're in the, uh, like I said, the office, um, you know, commercial office space is tough. But, uh, but certainly, you know, if you're in the business of helping people go online, sh shop online, sell online, you know, work in a virtual way. I think the, you know, people that are doing things virtually are big winners right now. It'll be interesting to see how that holds up once we get uh, a little bit further down the road. Uh, all right, so uh, anybody else ha have any comments or questions uh, before we move on to the next thing? I was gonna, uh, let's, let's uh, shift the question and I'm gonna talk about uh, happiness. So uh, we want some positivity here, so. <laughs> So a lot of entrepreneurs that say, um, you know, a question would be, are you happy and what would you change? You know, happiness is so important. And, and as an entrepreneur, uh, I guess the question is, are you happy as an entrepreneur? And, and um, what do you, and if you are, how do you, how, how, how do you stay happy? How, how does that happen when you're, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs sacrifice a lot, you know, you work, a lot of them are workaholics. You put a lot of hours, you sacrifice sometimes your health and, relationships and sometimes money and sometimes the money works out well, sometimes not. Um, but are you happy overall doing what you're doing? I guess is the question. So we'll start, Cindy, we'll start with you and go around. How, are you a happy entrepreneur? I hope so. I mean, like anybody else, you know, there are definitely ups and downs and sometimes the down days you're like, oh my gosh, why in the world did I take this on? Um, but I think with anything, you know, if you've got the passion for something, you're going to stay happy because you, you have the drive and you have, it's, it's a different kind of like love for what you're doing. Um, and if you don't have that drive, it's, it is hard to stay happy because it's, there are a lot of ups and downs and sometimes the downs can, can really pull you. 
you know, into a direction that it's, I call it the tailspin or, you know, the deep dive, you know, in, and you have to have, you know, that passion to be able to pull yourself back out and go, okay, well, why did I do this? Go to your network, you know, talk to somebody else that kind of helps talk you through, you know, the, whatever it is. And then, you know, you're off to the next thing. So, so I would say overall the answer is, yeah, you know, I don't think I'd yeah. be here. <laughs> Sometimes being an entrepreneur is kind of lonely. And so it's it's really Definitely. good when you have peers where you can commiserate with, you know. And yeah. so, so that's, that's what very helpful. our folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just about the yeah. time you think, oh my gosh, nobody understands what you're going yeah. through. Um, mm-hmm. There, I can tell you right now, there we have a whole community of, of people that have either been there, done that, or at least if nothing else, you know, that particular day, it's just nice to see a bright spot yeah. and feel like, okay, I'm not alone. Tomorrow's another day. Tackle it from another direction. Hey, Jordan, how about you? Are you happy? Of course. Yeah. I, happy I think as an entrepreneur, you have to drive yourself to be happy because happiness is ultimately everything. It, it, in my opinion, I, you know, I have to wake up and motivate myself I have to get out of bed every day, just like everyone does, no matter who you work for, if you work for a business or you work for yourself. And, you know, my family comes first and that keeps me happy. My children, uh, uh, you know, being, being able to know that I have that support at the end of the day, even if, you know, they say it's lonely at the top. (laughs) And it it is as an entrepreneur, when you put so much time and effort and you're just so hyper-focused on something, uh, you know, it's like prospecting for gold. I've told people as, you know, a prospector puts in so much effort and, you know, they don't get anything out of it until they discover gold. So um, it's kind of the same mentality. You got to get up and keep chipping away at it every day uh, and can't give up. You can't right. give up. Well, I like your comment about family. You know, I, a lot of you are familiar, you know, that I have four children and, and uh, at a very young age, I used to get them involved in some of my early business. When I had Quillage, I would just have a, a vending machine and I'd have them operate the vending machine. So every weekend they'd have to go to Sam's Club and, and restock the vending machine and, and they could take five bucks out every week or whatever, uh-huh. to, to, but to try to get them involved in entrepreneurship. And, and, uh, and then later on when we were doing board pack, whatever, they would, all of them have done trade shows with me. They'd go travel and, and make them work the trade show. And that actually helped a ton. And I tried to change my mindset instead of B, how do I, how do I, you know, how do you, and I, how do I pass that entrepreneurship spirit onto my kids? And not that I want them all to be entrepreneurs. They do what they want, but uh, to, to share that time with them. And that really helped me with my happiness, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I, I like your comments on the children. How about you, Craig? Yeah, I would say overall, um, I'm really happy. And it's, again, it's easy to do that when you truly believe in what you're doing and you, the people that are around you believe in it as well and they support you. Uh, from like Jordan said, from family to other partners that you have to just the employees that you're working around every day and seeing how you affect their environment, their family, and their livelihoods as well. I think it's, a, it's important to, to truly have that spirit to believe in what you're doing. And a, again, every day, every one of us wake up unemployed until we make something happen each and every day that we're that we're doing our business. And uh, how about uh, Sean? Well, you know, uh, a couple of things that have come out from other folks here real quick was, you know, the whole idea that it's kind of lonely at the top. And it, <laughs> it definitely can be because nobody knows the pressure you're going through when you're right. the one in charge. I, I, in my case, I'm super lucky. I've got a business partner down in San Antonio and actually every business that I have. We, uh, it just kind of balances out and it's a rare thing that works. I don't necessarily recommend having a business partner and everything. But, uh, it's kind of like having two wives. It's once hard enough. Um, but, you know, it, it definitely helps to have somebody to, to co- you know, collaborate with and commiserate, I guess, in some cases. Um, but, you know, there was a rare um, happiness. I'm not sure if this is the right word, but certain satisfaction, you know, through the COVID of um, just, in the in the business that I've got uh, a number of employees, um, there's a there's a certain happiness, satisfaction to just you know getting through it together 
and um, you know, letting your guard down a little bit, saying, "Hey, this is a little bit scary what we're going through," but you know, we need to let everybody know because um, you know, hey, we're kind of in it together. <laughs> right? And it was a little bit of that, you know, sharing the, uh, you know, kind of pulling your pants. That, that's going to come off really the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> pulling your pants down a little bit and kind of showing a little bit of, oh, gosh, this, you know, it's like you don't really want to show the numbers, right, of your business to your employees and like let them know how bad things could get. But, you know, kind of letting your guard, that's a better word, letting your guard down. Holy cow, did I say that on Skype? That's like. You know, one of those weird, awkward moments. Uh, <laughs> you know, letting your guard down and showing your numbers right. and then, you know, kind of banding together, you know, it makes it easier to get through. And there's a certain degree of satisfaction, and I would say happiness to getting through it together and, um, you know, as a team and, and, you know, that satisfaction of not laying anybody off, not, you know, cut and pay and stuff like that. It, it was an interesting thing because I've always kind of been a little bit of a solo preneur, solopreneur, is that how you say it? Entrepreneur. Right. To the last few years in one of my businesses, we've, we've grown quite a few employees, uh, mostly in Texas, but um, some here. And, um, and, and that was a, a new sort of happiness that I had of, you know, getting through it and not laying anybody off. And, you know, but there's a lot of pressure to that too. So I think yeah, it's good whether yeah. you got a business partner or other business owners that you can, you know, collaborate with that, that that's really important to help, you know, stay happy. Yeah. One of the comments online uh, was about from uh, Brad O'Daniel and he was asking, you know, when you're in survival mode right now, what is the number one thing you recommend absolutely do not cut back on? And the number one thing you recommend to consider cutting out and and uh, for me, you know, it's the, the team. And when you get quality people, I mean, I've been so fortunate. I mean, I go back nearly 30 years working with Alan Grow, And Alan and I have just, you know, found a nice groove in terms of how we, you know, you know, he's much more structured and, and very, you know, very detail oriented, whatever. And I tend to be more, more of the creative side or whatever, and, and more throwing too much stuff at the wall, perhaps. But, um, but, you know, that, that I could have never gotten through COVID or more <laughs> the past 30 years without, without his help. And not just him, but all the different people I've worked, had the fortunate uh, opportunity to work with over the years. And, you know, when you get, that's, what's really cool is when you get that team of people and they really click, you can feel like you can conquer anything. So, uh, so I wouldn't, I, you know, try, try your best not to cut, cut back on you know when you got your a players you want to make sure you keep them right. um keep them in, uh, in the fold and um and um but same time if you have others that that may not be uh you know that's where you might look but but other than that you know cutting back you know everybody says well first thing you cut back usually people usually cut back marketing expenses etc first uh, uh in time of crisis has been my experience but then you know try to do what you can. You got to. You have to protect your key players and your team. Otherwise, you're not going to be around. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else want to comment on that? Who did I miss here? Jeff, did I hit you on this question? Happiness. You know, you have a new baby. How can you not be happy? Not right. baby anymore. He's already two and a half. That's wild. Right? <laughs> I know. Oh, wow. Time's flying. Yeah, I think I think the group hit on it pretty well. For me, it's you know from a business perspective make sure if you're you're taking a swing at building a company that it, it's, it's solving a, a problem that you're passionate about. I think that's um, getting into a business for the wrong reasons because you think there's, for whatever that reason is versus really being attached to that problem, I think uh, is the core, uh, to, uh, kind of the core to the happiness uh, or to the, the, the road to the lonely top as everyone said, because I think that's true and just surrounding yourself with the, the right people. And that's can be family, that can be the, the, the team, that can be co-founders who are taking yeah. on the risk with you to see if there's a business there, whatever it is. I think it's just being passionate about the, that, that consumer, the user you're solving for is, is how I view that. Cool. Did I miss anybody on that question? I think I got everybody, right? All right, let's go on to the next question. I had uh, um, just, this one's more around mistakes, you know, uh, we all make mistakes and, and, uh, and hopefully we learn from them quickly. <laughs> and uh, so I guess, you know, what are some of the mistakes uh, you wish you could have avoided um, in your entrepreneur uh, journey, in your business journey? 
are what what are some of those mistakes that you've had made and and wish that you would have avoided? So, Cindy, do you have any thoughts on that? Any <laughs> mistakes? Uh, we don't make any mistakes. We're just... <laughs> oh right, oh yeah. <laughs> if if you're an entrepreneur and haven't made a mistake, so I want to know who you are. <laughs> um, I think for for us and for myself, um, I think you know as an entrepreneur, we tend to kind of be in our own bubble you know, and do our own thing and not reach out, you know, to people. I'm the first one that will admit, you know, very early on in my career and probably even until fairly recently, I was never one to reach out for help. And actually a lot of that changed, you know, having, doing a whole new product where I was doing a lot of things, we were doing a lot of things as a team that none of us had ever done before. So we were being forced to, you know, reach out for help. And and now that, you know, I'm here at OPO and there's so many other players, you know, here to reach out to. Now I feel like, you know, if, if there's, I'm not sca- anywhere near as scared, I guess you could say, or fearful of certain things as I probably used to be, mostly because I would stick to myself and try to just figure it out because I should know what that answer is. And now it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a there's a big world out there for one thing, as well as, you know, to have that kind of comfort level of even just reaching out to certain other entrepreneurs in this OPO space has made it a lot easier for me to just keep getting out there and, um, you know, working with new things. So. Yeah, cool. All right. Anybody else? So let's go to uh, Jordan. How about you? So um, what was the so question what, again? What, what yeah. Mistakes. So what are some of the mistakes you've made and you wish you could have avoided? Um, I would say in business in general, uh, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, when you're the, the big thing at stake is your own money. If you're investing in your own business is trusting people early on. Um, or trusting some people in general, you know, learning uh, better ways to uh, qualify, I guess, the people you work with and do it in a smart way and, and make sure everything's checked out. Uh, I've had some instances, you know, where I've lost money from people who have either, you know, scammed me on a, on a large order of uh, some smart home products or things like that. Uh, customers who, who haven't paid, especially during the pandemic, um, yeah. had that pop up. Uh, so yeah, it's not necessarily mistakes, but I'd say the mistake would be my mistake of trusting some people too early and uh, yeah. maybe not having something in a contract uh, specifically, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, so not, uh, they always talk about make sure you have a, as an entrepreneur, a, a good lawyer and a good uh-huh. banker and a, a good accountant, yeah. those three things. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, that you can't underestimate. How about you, Craig? Um, I would say for, for us, part of it would be trying to scale quicker than the infrastructure and the foundation was there. Um, you know, having the confidence in, in the team to, to do it, but recognizing, well, how, what would happen if the client said, yep, I'll take 300 of those when we know we can only deliver 50. So making sure that we, we take a step back and we look at the foundation of the, of the company and the ability to scale in, in, the, yeah. in the size that the clients would ask for. Yeah, I know for myself in terms of scaling, when I, uh, back in the 90s when I started Quilogy, I tried to do it all myself. I felt like I had to be on every project. I had to do everything. And um, it wasn't until I let go of the technical side, I said, all right, I'm not gonna code anymore because we were in the IT uh, services business and we provided, you know, we built custom software for people. And I was a coder, Alan was a coder. We would hire, all, you know, we were hiring one, two, at some one point, I think we probably had five or six coders a day during the internet um, ramp up. and. Um, I know those early days, what was holding us back was, well, if we're all doing that coding, who's running the bit, who's doing the hiring, the firing, the business development, you know, the marketing, the accounting. Every, and so it wasn't until I stepped back and said, all right, I got to let that go. Let I trust the people that we've hired. If you hire quality people, trust them, let them run with it. Then that's when the business really began to scale. And I know not every business is made out to scale, but 
but if you are in the, you know, if that's what you're trying to do and, and your vision is to, you know, own the world or whatever someday in whatever market you're in, you have to be willing to let go of some things in order for it to grow. So, uh, you know, waiting too long for me, my mistake was, you know, I, I didn't trust my people soon enough. And I, I've since learned that, uh, the, you know, the quality people we hire, they're smarter than me and, and, um, and uh, letting them do, get, out, get out of their way and let them do their work, do their job. How about, uh, how about Sean, how about you? Any, what, what was your biggest mistake and that you wish you would have avoided? Hiring the wrong people. People, <laughs> yeah. One. I think, you know, I, anytime, you, anytime that I've hired out of desperation, it's like, I got to hire somebody now, right? And it, it always ends up being the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always say hire, hire slow, fire fast. That's yeah, the, and I've made that mistake. <laughs> I made, I made both sides of that yeah. mistake several times. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, but you I, know, I, on, on another yeah. note, and I'll try to leave it, just be real quick. Is I did, I don't know why I didn't think of this. It's because it happened way before COVID. But you know, along the lines of hiring the wrong person, well, the wrong person exposed uh, some remote working holes that I had, and ended up leading to a really ugly situation. I mean, straight literally FBI, like I had, I was texting the FBI because this guy was essentially, um, uh, what's the, I don't even know what the technical term is. He essentially stole a bunch of my data and was trying to uh, use it as leverage to get money out of me. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a remote worker and I didn't have the proper safeguards in place, uh, but it was long before COVID. I've, I've been remote first from the beginning. I was just naively remote working right and letting my people work and just assuming they were all good people and would follow the rules and you know <laughs> i if bottom line I, I i i had a wrong feeling about them and i should have never hired them and it led to a lot of bad and heartache yeah that's a people it's a big big deal a big deal jeff how about you real quick what's uh biggest mistake you've made that you wish you could have avoided yeah, I think it's just knowing when to delegate. I think the point's been hit. That's both delegate internally and externally. So for me, the biggest mistake was uh, not focusing on, you know, the, the one, two, maybe three big rocks that an entrepreneur's to-do list has. And, uh, you know, in the future, it's going to be finding any of those, uh, those tasks that you can delegate either internally or using Upwork or Fiverr or Magic or Wonder. There's so many tools, whether it's research or customer list building, whatever that is, there's, there's, you're normally going to find a cheaper way to do it uh, and focus on the stuff that the founder needs to focus on. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, we're only, we only have about five minutes. I need to be respectful of everybody's time. So I'm going to do a lightning round here just on, uh, on a very simple question. And it is, uh, do you plan on retiring? So as an entrepreneur, I always get this question, you know, Randy, why don't you have on a beach somewhere, you know, uh, I've sold a few businesses, whatever. Um, you know, so I guess the question is, do you, do you get any of you plan on retiring and just going out on the beach or are you just going to work to the last breath? What's, what's your, what, what, what do you think you're going to, have you thought about that or what's your thoughts? So Cindy? Yeah. Oh, I, I've gotten this question how many times and here I am, you know, I'm not going to say towards the end of my career, because I will never be towards the end of my career. So I'm answering your question. <laughs> I won't ever retire. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, take on an entire trade association at this stage of my <laughs> career. So I don't see myself retiring, you know, and honestly, anytime. I think if you love what you do, you know, you're you probably won't actually 100% retire, you know, to, to be able to have a little more free time at some point. Uh, yeah, maybe go play with my grandbabies and, you know, go do some fun stuff. But I love my work. So, you know. Well, you know, and you have a daughter that you're working with as well. Yeah, so. yeah. So I, I, I keep things, you know, in the family as much as I can too. So, so okay. that's, that's nice. How about you, Jordan? You plan on retiring? You're gonna build this mega home with all this <laughs> fancy hey, uh, electronics and just kind of <laughs> hibernating there, or what? Uh, probably not that. No, um, I don't know if I'll ever retire. I mean, that's not even. I'm I'm only 32 years old. Retirement's not even in my vocabulary right now. <laughs> so, and with with a young family with kids, but you know, definitely not. But. Um, if I have to like think about how I build my business for my future, 
I, you know, I've been thinking more recently as I grow, like building my business as if I was going to sell it, always kind of be in that mentality uh, and always kind of strive for that. Um, it doesn't mean retirement, you know, it, I, I, I would want my business to obviously outlive me. So if I'm involved, you know, uh, in a later year in my life in my business still or multiple other businesses, whatever you know, my journey is, I don't think I'll retire officially. I'm not going to be expecting a severance package or anything like that <laughs> from someone else. So, <laughs> I use an important term, journey, and I think that's what we're all on. Yeah. So, yeah. Craig, how about you? Do you ever think about retirement uh, in your future, or do you feel like you're just going to keep going, or what? I'm probably going to keep going, Randy. I'm, I'm the kind of guy that after about – Three days worth of time, and I probably lose my mind at home and wonder what I'm going to do next. It's so hard to sit still. It's you know I just got all the energy nonstop all the time, and I I think about it, and I look at my my parents and some of my you know friends that are you know selling businesses at 75 and still going into the office every day at 95. Yeah, I'm like yeah. you know if if you enjoy what you do, it's not a, it's not a job really. Right. Right. Sean, how about you? Are you going to retire to barbecue backyard or what? Well, I think like everybody else, circling back to the happiness issue, I don't think I'd be very happy retired. <laughs> very good. And, and last, uh, Jeff, how about you? I, you're, you're, you're on your at least third, fourth venture or whatever. I've got some more swings left to take. So uh, yeah, <laughs> not looking at that yet, but uh, one day for sure, I think similar to everyone here, there'll still be some sort of work or passion product, whether it's switching to the investing side or something like that. But uh, I want to take a few more swings first. So we'll see. I, yeah, I think one of the, the most satisfying things is when, as an entrepreneur, if you create something or whatever, and, and you have some, you have a customer that's really, when you, when you get that first payment, you know, where they, somebody's willing to pay you for the concept that you created or the business that you started and you're start getting checks in them or oh, it's not check, it's payments now, I guess. But, uh, but that concept that people are willing they, uh, to, to pay you for that product or service uh, that you, that you've created is one of the, the best feelings here is that you're adding value. You know, you put on this planet to, to um, you know, to, um, to provide something, you know, for the, for the world that we live in. And, and I think that's one of the best, you know, that you're useful, you know, and that people are useful enough that people are willing to give you money for it. That's a pretty cool thing. And, and then, um, and then you can continue to, to, uh, to have that evolve and you keep working on it every day and it gets better and better. And there's a little thing that you start off ends up being, you know, something much, much bigger than you would have ever dreamed of. And, and that's, that's a pretty cool thing to have the opportunity um, to, to be a part of that journey coming back to what Jordan was talking about. So with that, our journey today is over. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for participating. You guys have been awesome. I love having, so thankful to have all of you part of OPO. And I love just the concept of being in a place where I can walk in the door and, and have these chats with people like you and have these opportunities. It's, it's really a cool thing. So thank you all. And, and thanks for your openness uh, to uh, sharing today. That was really cool. So thank you all very much. And we'll have to do this more often. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks.